Good morning students and welcome back to physics classroom. In our previous class we had discussed a little bit about rest and motion and introduced the concepts about how if the object changes its position with respect to surroundings it is considered to be in the state of motion while if it does not change its position with respect to its immediate surroundings it is considered to be in the state of rest. Rest and motion are relative terms because the state of an object is totally decided by comparing its position with respect to its surroundings. Now today we will proceed a bit further and introduce certain terms that will help us more to understand the basic concept of motion. Now all such quantities are called physical quantities. Now we will try and define what are physical quantities. Any quantity that can be measured. Now whatever quantity we can measure easily are placed in the group of physical quantities. Now before proceeding any further I would like to clarify a little bit about the term quantity. Like I have seen many a times a bit confusion exists between the students uh, when an example of this particular thing called quantity is asked. Like if I give an example, you are asked to measure the length of a table and I ask the same question that what is the quantity in this particular sentence. In this entire sentence, if you have to identify the quantity, then mostly the students reply that table is the quantity. But actually the table is an object and not a quantity. So the quantity in this case was actually length. Length was supposed to be measured. So length is the quantity that is going to be measured and that's why length is the physical quantity. So similar to length, all such quantities that we can measure like time, temperature, energy, mass, force, distance, displacement, speed and so on. All these are physical quantities. Now I have cited a couple of examples. You are having distance, time, speed, mass, displacement, velocity, acceleration, force and momentum. Now we will be studying a couple of these terms in this very lesson and more of these terms in the coming chapters. Now you might be wondering as to why I have used two different colors for showing the examples. On one side I have shown distance, time, speed and mass and on the other side I have shown you displacement, velocity, acceleration, force and momentum. I have done it intentionally. Now talking about distance, time, speed and mass, a basic similarity amongst all these is that they have got only magnitude. Now what is magnitude? Magnitude is actually the quantity, the amount of that particular physical quantity. So the amount of that physical quantity or what is called magnitude is solely giving us complete information regarding all these examples distance, time, speed and mass. How? Let us understand a bit more about this. Like for instance you are asked to measure the distance between two cities. Say city A and city B is situated at a distance of approximately 60 km. Then while explaining the distance or mentioning the distance between these two places, do we ever need to mention the direction? Like if you are moving from say Delhi to Jaipur and then coming back from Jaipur to Delhi, the distance is going to remain the same if you have followed the same path. Does it matter? Like if you are going from De Delhi to Jaipur, the distance is say 100 km and coming back from Jaipur to Delhi, is it is more than 100 km? Obviously not. It is going to be, remain exactly 100 km. It is not at all dependent on the direction in which you are traveling. Similarly, if someone asks you what is the time right now, you say 5 p.m. Then 5 p.m. has got nothing to do whether you are mentioning the time towards north east, west or south. Just imagine you say that my mass is 40 kg in the north and 50 kg in the south. It is absolutely wrong. It makes just no sense. 
So all such physical quantities that have got only magnitude are placed in one group called scalar. These are called scalar quantities. Let's quickly move over to the next group of physical quantities, displacement, velocity, acceleration, force and momentum. I am choosing one quantity about which we have studied in class 8, force. Force is responsible for changing the state of an object that we have studied in class 8. Force always tends to produce a change in the state, shape, size of an object. Say I tell you that I have applied a force of 10 Newton on a box. You are supposed to tell me in which direction it is going to move. Can you tell me? Absolutely not. Because I have not told you in which direction I have applied the force. Unless I mention that whether I was pushing the box or pulling it towards myself, how can you let me know that in which direction the box may move? So it is absolutely important for me to let you know that how much force has been applied and in which direction the force has been applied. So such physical quantities in which both magnitude as well as direction plays important role complete information of such quantities can be given with the help of both magnitude and direction such physical quantities are placed in another group and they are called vector quantities so from now onwards whenever a new topic is introduced whenever a new term is introduced you need to understand whether it is a scalar or a vector scalars will have only magnitude while vectors will have both magnitude and direction so physical quantities having only magnitude are called scalar quantities while physical quantities having both magnitude and direction are called vector quantities now let's understand a bit about how motion is going to be identified by changing the position of the object. For this we are making use of this simple example. You can see the object is moving from a fixed point x equal to 0 meter and it is free to move on both the sides from this fixed point. Now whenever we are describing the change in position of an object, a moving object, then that change in position has to be mentioned with respect to a fixed point. The fixed point is considered to be the reference point for indicating position and this particular position of the object, the reference position of the object is called origin. Now this particular term might appear familiar to you all because you have already studied about this term origin in graph. While plotting graphs you always measure the position of an object with respect to origin which is considered to be 0, 0, 0. 0, 0 refers to x and y coordinate. x coordinate is also 0 while y coordinate is also 0. So if you are plotting any value on the x axis that is plotted with respect to the origin, if you are plotting any point with on the y axis that is also plotted with reference to the origin. Now just consider this example x equal to 0 meter is the position of this particular object. Now once it starts moving, let's see what happens. It starts moving, it moves up to 5, so position changes by 5, it becomes plus 5 meter. We are following the same convention as followed in a graph. It comes back to 0, so x is 0, again the position is 0, it goes towards left, so position is minus 6 x equal to minus 6 meter. The convention as we usually adopt in graphs, right side is positive and left side is negative. So reference point becomes so important in indicating position of the object. The change in position of the object as I was telling you, the concept of origin or reference point, see how it can be easily shown on a graph paper. The object has moved up to 6 position on the x axis, so position was 6, 0. Now it is moving towards y axis, so it becomes 0, 4. So always the measurement is being done with refer reference to the 
origin. So when it is moving towards left, it becomes minus 4, 0. Now let's see what happens when it moves in any random direction. When it goes in the down direction, that is negative y-axis, it becomes 0, minus 5. Now just consider this example. There is an object which is moving along a path. Now you can see a calculation is being done as to how much length it has covered. It is 33.58 cm. Now let's see what happens it moves in the opposite side. The length has been calculated. It is 34.425 cm. Now let's see. Once it travels in a very random path, again the calculation is being done. Let's see how much it turns out to be. The total length, the total path length covered by the object has been calculated. And now it turns out to be 132.155 cm. So in all these cases you have seen that the total path length covered by the object was being calculated and this actually is nothing but distance. So when I am saying that the distance between two places is 60 km, this means that the length of the path that is joining these two places is actually 60 km. So total path length covered by an object is called distance. The standard unit or what is called the SI unit of distance is meter. Now can anybody tell me, do you have any instrument which can measure distance? Is there any instrument? Of course there is. Now for measuring small lengths, we can make use of say a meter scale or a measuring tape. But for measuring distances, we are not in the situation to use such instruments. So obviously for measuring distances, we have an instrument called an odometer fitted in every vehicle. You might have seen an odometer fitted in a motorcycle that measures the total distance traveled by that motorcycle or an odometer fitted in a car that displays the total distance in kilometers. Now if you want to measure the distance traveled today by any vehicle then for that you need to keep a track of the value displayed on the odometer in the beginning of the journey and then when the journey ends what is the value displayed now. Subtracting these two values, you can find out what is the distance traveled by the object. Just imagine in the beginning of the journey, the value displayed by the odometer is 1, 5, 7, 6 kilometer. In the end of the journey, it displays 1, 5, 9, 5 kilometer. Then what the what is the distance traveled by the object today? You can subtract these two values 1595 minus 1576 and that will give you how much? 19 kilometer. So the distance traveled today will be 19 kilometer. In this manner using an odometer you can find out the distance traveled by any object. Now suppose in this same situation where you can see the position, starting position of the object is shown and where it ended, the journey ended, that is also shown. If suppose I ask you two questions, what is the distance travelled and also tell me what is the shortest length between the starting and the end point. So you can see if you compare the two positions like where the journey began and where it ended, the shortest path is very small while the actual path length what the object actually traveled that is quite large. Let's see if suppose the same situation is seen in a different perspective as to how to find out the shortest length between the two points. What happens? We will start from the beginning. The object is moving along a path. So the distance traveled turns out to be 30.405 and now the shortest path is 30.25. That is a very slight difference because the actual path length was a bit curved. But the shortest path is always a straight line path. 
See now it, the distance was 32.941, displacement 17.38 cm. It's a straight line joining the starting and the end point. Now let's see. We consider a straight line path and try to find out the distance travelled as well as the shortest distance. Both are exactly similar 32.5. Let's see in this way. In the previous case, even though there was a slight difference, even this case, there is a very slight difference 21.382 and 21.4. So, using these concepts, you can understand, using this example, you can understand that the path length travelled by the object and the shortest length between the starting and the final point might be different from one another. So, the shortest path between the two points the starting point and the final point is what is called displacement so displacement is the shortest distance between two points now to understand this in a much better way let us proceed with another activity let's see what happens when the object which is initially at position 5 starts moving initially it moves up to 7 so the change in position is plus 7 subtracted minus 2. So that gives us plus 2 meter. Next it moves from minus 5 to minus 1. So minus 1 minus minus 5 that gives you delta x equal to plus 4 meter. In both the cases the object was moving towards right and its change in position acquires a positive value. Again plus 2 minus minus 1 delta x is plus 3 meter. So, can you figure out a similarity? Movement towards right is always positive. When it moves towards left, minus 1 minus plus 2 delta x becomes minus 3 meter. So, when it moves towards left, the change in position acquires a negative value. So, in this example, we can understand that sometimes if we are a bit particular about specifying the direction then one direction is positive the other direction is negative so change in position does acquire a positive value while moving in one specific direction and it acquires a negative value on moving in the other the opposite direction that's what the concept of displacement tells us displacement can acquire both positive and negative values it can be positive, it could be negative. And just imagine if suppose an object comes back to its starting position, the shortest distance may even become zero. Like just consider the example of yourself. When you are traveling from your home to school and back to home, school to home, home to school. Say suppose a student lives at a distance of 10 kilometers from the school. So he travels 10 kilometers in the morning from his home to school and returns 10 kilometer. So, 10 kilometer plus 10 kilometer that becomes 20 kilometers. So, total path length or the total distance traveled by the student is 20 kilometers. But what is his displacement? The shortest distance between his starting point that is his home and the end point that is his home. So, that should be 0. So, just imagine the distance traveled was 20 kilometer while the displacement is 0. So, distance and displacement can acquire different values. Now, there is an assignment for today. List the difference between distance and displacement giving suitable examples. Now, I have already mentioned a couple of differences between both these topics in this class. If you can figure out some more differences, it will be better. So, giving suitable examples, you will list the difference between distance and displacement. We will end our session today. We will continue with the remaining topics in our next class. Thank you.